after the color beginning, make it as smooth and beautiful and peaceful as you can. Peace is beauty. Smooth is beauty. Smooth skin is beautiful. Smooth walls are beautiful. Smooth um, rocks are beautiful. So smoothness is beautiful and peacefulness is beautiful. Big rule. Then our drawing, as fine as we can and as simple as we can. Simple does not mean easy. Simple means just one thing done as well as we can. Right. Now we're moving on. So that's the, the color beginning and the blocking in. Now we're going to move on to the massing in. And for the massing in, we're looking at the colors of shadow. The colors, so that would be in the lemon, it would be the color of the shadow there, there, maybe the color of the shadow there. That's what we're going to be looking at. And that's what we're going to be playing with. It's not easy. Not easy. Nothing is easy. There is something that was said, I think it was Freud who said that there are no accidents. That accidents don't exist. And there's another saying that nothing happens to us by accident. Everything is planned for us. Everything is calculated to our benefit. That is a, a more philosophical saying. That the universe conspires for our benefit, for our uh, blessing. And things that we think are accidental and, and, and pure chance, they're not. They have been worked out centuries in advance by the angels. And then they come to us. Okay, so I want to mix um, the color of the lemon in shadow. And it's essentially it's a green color. So I'm going to bring this thing in here. Oh, I knocked it again. I hate it when I do that. Okay, I bumped it. So the green with yellow. Here's my green and I mix the color directly underneath here. At the moment it's much too dark so I'm adding more yellow. Yellow is a beautiful color to lighten green with because it also gives us a color, a variety of the color. And you can also add, if we wanted to, we can also add white to that color. Get it even more beautiful. Now it's tricky because I've got to lift this thing away to see what the color is on the real lemon, but I think I'm getting closer here where I've got the white paint in as well. So I'm going to hold it in my left hand like this right here, just slightly off the screen. And then I'm going to start my scumbles. And the scumble will start on the lemon. Big brush is a number eight, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's a number eight. And I'll scumble it in like that. It's a little bit too dark. My paint is a little bit too wet. That's fine because the paint will dry very, very, very quickly. Now I'm going to lighten this basic green color of mine. And I'm going to repeat what I've just done. More yellow. On the other lemon, there's no accident. That's, that's what Freud said. And nothing happens to us by chance. That is what the Greek philosophers said. Nothing happens by chance. Everything is fate. So now, I'm trying to take advantage. I'm not trying to, to exploit the fact that I made an accident there. I made a mistake there. I don't want to exploit it. I just want to show the darker part there dark up to there and then it starts to be lighter and more yellow and then there is a little bit of darkness just there and that little bit of brightness can have a bit more yellow in it that light shadow and then there's more shadow here shadow there and I'll work slightly over the edges with this Slightly over the edges. It's a good thing to work over the edges all the time. So now the two le lemons have virtually disappeared. Very soon I won't have to think about two lemons and I'll think intuitively of this lemon or of that lemon. I won't have to worry about it. Okay, so that's the beginning of the dark colors. Other dark colors in this painting would be... Oh, I'll take this thing away would be the dark shadow, which is more blue. 
blue gray. Blue gray just means really a dirty blue. Blue brown means a dirty brown. Every gray, every brown is actually a color. So that when we say uh, gray, no, let's start with brown. Let's start with the word brown. When we say something is brown, it doesn't mean that it's burnt sienna or another color like that. It means that it's a very subtle color. So when you say something is brown, very subtle color. That subtle color can be blue, subtle blue, or subtle red, or subtle green, subtle yellow, uh, even subtle silver. But a color that's made subtle is a brown. So brown means subtle color. So there is never such a color as brown. When there's nothing that we can paint brown. Brown is a subtle color and we have to look, explore with our eyes and identify the subtle color that is that brown. Uh, this shadow comes in this direction here, and I'll mark it off like that. There. Scumble it in like that with a scrubby motion. And in there. This scrubbiness of the, the zigzag of the scumble is a beautiful thing, and you can see it in lots of paintings. The place where I've seen it to the greatest effect has always been in Toulouse Le Trek. I thought he, he executed perfect scumbles and perfect not just perfect scumbles but also perfect zigzags see I've changed my blue here a little bit my shadow here is definitely blue and the color that I'm doing now is a little bit more intensely blue but still very very pale and I'm going right up to and off the edge now remember these couple of things about your about your dogs about your scumbles your scumble or your dogs are always as richly colored or tinted as possible. So if this is any blue in it, make sure that you show the blue. Don't make it black plus white. Black plus white is a horrible color, it's not even a gray. Black plus white is like pigeon droppings. It's horrible, bird droppings. But a blue that is very muted very subtle is very beautiful and that is what the, what the word grey means. So now there's more of this kind of blue-grey on the far end of our still life here where it comes from this lemon, from either lemon, from the lemon, comes this way, add some more white into it to make it a bit paler seems a bit paler to me around here and if you've got one set of scumbled lines of, of zigzag lines zigzag strokes and you and add another set of zigzag strokes to it it becomes richer and more beautiful this can gently gently dissolve into the green and what should happen is where it dissolves into the green it should be an invisible passage where the where the blue gray meets the green you should not be able to distinguish it. That's a lost edge, and lost edges are very, very important in painting. Lost edges where one color meets another color in such a way that it fades together completely, or runs together completely, or merges completely. Okay. That's not too bad. So now I've got a, a plot, a plot, plotting, a map, of the light and dark in this painting. I could, for the rest now, this is, these are the darker areas. Okay, so the three things. The first thing that you need to do with your, with your scumbles or with your darker colors is make them as light as possible. This is pretty light, this is pretty light, that's pretty light. I don't think I can go much lighter than this. If I wanted to, I could add more white into it. But if I did make it whiter in any place, then I'd have to make all of it lighter. 
That's not a bad thing, but it's not really what I'm after, so I'll just lighten that bit as an experiment, because that's lighter than it was before. Now it's darkening it a little bit again, so it's not quite as light, but it's richer in color. So these are the things. The first thing is as light as possible. You can run it in, you can run it right in, like by 10 centimeters if you like, you can run the color in. And merge it together. Merge it a little bit less. The second thing is, it must be as rich in color as possible. So this must be as green as possible. Not greener than the lemon, but as green as possible to get me to the lemon. This must be as blue as possible. Not bluer than the shadow, but as blue as possible and still true to the shadow. And the third thing is, it must be as flat as possible. Now flat means smooth. Flat is like, you know, how should we say, if the sea outside, looking out outside my window now, the sea is absolute peaceful, it looks like a lake. That means flat. That same sea can be tempestuous. It can be full of waves. Then it is stormy and it is dramatic, but it is not flat. So make your, make your color washes, your scumbles, as flat as possible. As rich in color as possible. So a green or blue or red or whatever as possible. In the shadows. All in the shadows. Your scumbles only go into the shadows. And the third thing. As flat, as pale, as light as possible. Okay, let's start from the beginning. As light as possible. As tinted as possible. And as flat as possible. That would give us a good and useful grey. Uh, a useful scumble. So here, if this brush is dry enough, and I don't think it is, I'll just dry it a little bit on the toilet paper on my, on my uh, palette. And do some really quite dryish brush strokes here. Soften to dissolve that a little bit. Right. So the darks are now done. There are other areas around here where it's half dark. Now a half dark is part of the light. And then there are variations in this green where there's reflected light coming from that side. The reflected light comes in from there. If I put my hand there, it actually gets pinker, more orangey. Take my hand away and it's green again. Can you see it in there? But yeah, you can just about see it. Those are very important. They're part of the shadow, and that's going to happen because we will articulate our shadows later on. But for the rest now, we're going to start on the on the pale colors, on the light colors, and the light colors use a completely different technique. Two techniques, in fact. Light colors are described with direct painting, which is individual strokes like Monet and Renoir and the Impressionists and also with impasto. So this demonstration here, the one that we're working on now, building a painting is going to consist of three things. Scumbles, direct painting, and impastos. And the interesting thing is going to be with the impastos that the impastos do not have to follow uh, step six in a sequence. The impastos can be step two in a sequence, and I've done it often before, but um, that's just a little, a little side side information. The impastors can happen whenever we want to. And then, uh, because then... But essentially, you wouldn't really do your impastors before you design your areas of darkness. But if I wanted to now, I could, could put an impasto yellow right there. I could. And it'll be thick and it'll be heavy. But I don't want to break this, the sequence because that's the teaching sequence. First, your base color. Then your line drawing then your shadows, then your lights, then your ex extreme lights, or your bright lights, your impastos, and that's the end of the building of the painting. When we've done all that, the painting is built. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix the color of the tabletop just there. That is basically, I've got a dirty brush now. A dirty brush is actually, it's quite funny. A dirty brush is not a problem. Let's say you do as I do. You want to start your new painting session. 
with a brand new clean 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 brush so you got your brand new clean brush you mix this color and then you place the color the first placing is basically a test down drag stop and lift okay there's a problem with my color here it's too wishy-washy it's got too much um there's too much turpentine in it so i'll add some more pigment into this and the pigment the first pigment i'm going to add in is going to be white to make it a little bit lighter and blue to give it this lovely glow that i see in that area then i'm going to place this color again but i'm going to place it in a different direction slightly different place there okay. drag stop drag and stop and lift now that color to me seems about right it's very 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 hard to tell the only way you can tell really is to pick up your color that you've mixed or even mix it with a palette knife and hold it in front of the color that you want to that you want to paint now that looks very close like that very close like that okay this if i put it down like this it would be a palette knife stroke and i'm gonna do one anyway for fun and i'll do it across that one down drag stop and lift so that color and that color is really the same which is something that i normally would not like to do but that's okay so the palette knife and the brush there's not much difference between the stroke made by each if you do it relatively thin so now i'm adding some more white because i see maybe i imagine but i see the color lightening up here is that fluff no lightening up there and then a stroke like this which direction well the direction is dictated by your sense of touch if you were running your hand over a smooth surface like a white wall or a, or, or a roof tile or a floor tile or something like that then your hand would go in a certain direction i like the strokes that i'm applying here to go in that direction that is that dictated by the tactile quality of the mark there. oh that's a nice color it's lighter than any of the others that one is lighter than that one those two are about the same i don't like colors to be the same the impressionist method says they they put it down put down spots of color good spots of color are great but i've watched or looked at some of their paintings and some of the spots of colors they put down are the identical colors so for example i know that van gogh in a particular one of the paintings he mixed a, a blue sky a sky blue a slate blue kind of color and he used that color over and 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 over so he made about 40 maybe yeah maybe 50 strokes of that one color now that he might as well have scumbled it if they're all going to be the same color but he put them there, 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 there. Then the implication is he would have missed another blue to get a blue-gray variation like this, and he would have put that color somewhere else. Okay, down, drag, stop, and lift. An interesting thing is that when you have more medium mixed in with your color, the color comes off the brush better. Now I'm going to add some more blue into this mixture that I've already got and I'm going to add a tiny bit of sienna into it as well because what I want to do with this color I want to do that softening of the edge that's there you see there shadow there light but it's an impossible invisible transition so I'm going to go with a slightly darker color there and stop not bad now you could if you were stupid, you could go and try and blend it together like that. Now, stupid is the wrong word. If you were, if you were questioning the whole thing, you could. But in fact, if you put the right color there, 
then there should be an even transition from that to that. That might be too, but too much. So now to make it work better, come back to some more light, more white in the color here on this side. Although that color is different from that color, it should be nearly indistinguishable, or should be virtually indistinguishable. But now on the other side, the side of the shadow, it makes an extra, slightly dark color here. And again, I'll place this color here, just dragging from the yellow into the blue-gray. And now that color, is indistinguishable from the blue gray it's virtually identical uh, and we'll do another one which has got a bit more of the white in it here and there this color merges perfectly into that one so you don't try immediately to make it disappear like that or run together like that but you keep on placing your strokes placing your notes for the moment, nearly all of the colors that I'm noting, so I would go so far as to say all the colors I'm noting, are in this section of the painting. Yeah. That's not serious, but I don't want to fill this thing up, and I like to try and place each color far away from the other color so that I can continuously assess the nature of the color that I'm placing. Now I'm looking for the biggest gap here. There's a nice big gap there, a nice big gap here, a nice big gap there. But I think the biggest gap at the moment would probably be around here, on the edge. There. Like that. Now I've only got four gaps that are all about equal. But I'm not going to put anything there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and paint up there. Yeah. That color. That color. That deepish color. So that color... It's not only darker, it also seems to me to be a bit more warm. So I'm going to add some sienna in here to warm up that color and some blue to darken that color. Let's see. So I'm going to put a medium and I'm hoping it'll come off. Now, this brush that I'm using here is an old brush and it's not perfect because the brush is rounded at the tip, you see? It's rounded from age. It used to be a flat. Flat is marked with an F. Filbert is marked with F-I-L, so it looks more like a filbert than like a flat. But so, okay, so we place one color there. I'll place it on the edge there. There. Slightly warmer than this, slightly darker than this. I think it's a bit too dark. Add some more white in here. So what you do here is you place one color, see what you think. If you think it's too dark, make the next one a little bit lighter, like this. That's better. And lift it. But now these marks are not perfect brick-like shapes. If I use a brand new brush, well, it's not brand new, but it's newer. It's got a square tip, but a brand new brush will have a perfectly square tip. And I like it. I like the square tip. But I also like the the worn away tip, well, not a problem for me. Now I'm running out of white. The moment you run out of any color, take it and put it back on your palette because you cannot work without the color that you need. So you cannot lighten the white. You cannot lighten that color there of the brown there with anything except white. If you use yellow to lighten it, or ochre, it'll make it'll change the color. It will also maybe make it a little bit lighter, but it will also change the color. All right, so here, fresh, fresh white. And again, I'll go up there. Now, on this area as well, I'm running out of colors, but you see, okay, that one goes nicely, but I want to stop it there. These colors are merging together very, 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 very nicely. I'm going to take this color that I've just mixed, add a bit more white to it, and then come back here and place a stroke like that. Starting inside that blue, coat, blue stroke, drag it in here. See, now I can no longer make color notes which are completely separated from anything else. 
So now I'm forced every color, but I'm going to put down after this. We'll be touching another color. Maybe I can fit one more in here. Down. Drag. Stop and lift. I don't like the fact that there's a... Yeah. A bit of a blue streak in that one. Okay. Now it's nearly impossible to put down another color. But I will. I'll find, find a couple. One can go here, for example. It will touch nothing. Well, just about does touch. But after that... After this now, no color can go on in a second, and that is, that is what we're going for. As soon as this happens, we start unifying our color field. All these individual, discrete strokes, white in there, will now start to merge. It has to touch one at least, often two sometimes three so that's all coming nicely and when these come together nicely when they're all done this surface will look like snowflakes or like like autumn leaves on the ground so they merge together you can no longer tell them apart and that's what that's what i'm looking for no longer telling them apart okay. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and then I'll come back and carry on with this. We'll carry on with the uh, direct painting technique, that technique, that technique. Now, this is a brush which got more of a, a square tip. So it's just a bit newer than this one. A lot of artists, important artists, they like their brushes to get a little bit damaged like this because it makes a softer mark and the softer mark blends more easily with the marks next to it. But I'm going to switch to this brush because I want to make some smaller marks, particularly in the apple. The apple is fresh color. So I like the, to start with a clean brush. I mentioned before that a, a, a brush which is dirty is not really a problem because with this clean brush, I can make one clean stroke. After that, the brush is dirty. Whatever color is on there, the brush is in dirty from that color. So I'm going to start by mixing a nice yellow green. Not too light and not too dark. I'm essentially looking for that color right there. So I'll use my palette now to mix it because then I can easily test it. Mm. Flatter. You don't always have to do this. I mean, this is, this is just a method, a method. Not a bad method, but yeah, it, it seems to blend very nicely with the color that's already there, just there. I think a little bit more yellow. We are exploring, in the second stage, building a painting, we are exploring essentially three different techniques. The first one is the scumball. The second one is the direct painting. And the third one is impasto. Now I'm just going to try a little bit of an impasto stroke right there. Right there. Because the impasto stroke is very similar to the direct painting which is done with a brush. So, a oh, nice color. Want some more yellow in there. The yellow will make the, the green more yellowish, but it will also make it lighter, which is exactly what I'm looking for at the moment. And a slightly broader stroke. And this stroke I'll place here. Down. Drag. Drag. Stop. And lift. Okay. That one is not really lighter. So more yellow plus some white to make sure that this time there will be a color difference. I'm going to apply this one with a palette knife. This will be the last of the strokes that I'll apply with a palette knife right now. And then I'm going to switch back to the brush. So down, drag, stop. 
and lift. So what happens here with the pellet nut stroke is that the pellet nut stroke is not always um, the lightest thing. And it's not always the final thing that you can apply. So now I'm going to go back to these colors that I've mixed with my pellet knife, which is nice. Because it means that the mixtures are a little bit more generous. And I apply the stroke now with a brush in exactly the same way as I did the other ones with the um, with a pellet knife. So yeah, these strokes can go into those. So essentially, when you use a paint as thick as this on your brush, it is also an impasto. It is also, it's only then now it is a brush impasto. There's a nice stroke. But I need a variation of color just there. And that variation that I'm looking for, just there where the highlight would be, would be first a broadish stroke of just yellow. I'll take the yellow and mix a bit of white into it, make it even paler. Pale yellow. And I'll apply this with a palette knife, but I'm gonna apply it slightly, slightly broad, slightly broad stroke. So like this. Down, drag, stop, and lift. It could be even paler. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Mix a lot more white into this pale yellow color. And I'll apply that with my pellet knife again because I'm looking for this light note there. Not bad, not good. Um, I like what it's doing, but I would like to take off that very, very hard edge there. I'll just break it like that. And I think with the same color, maybe a little bit more yellow into it. I'm going to do another stroke. Yeah, this is sort of a, a crease on the lemon that I like. There. So, the lemon is beginning to, to look very energetic. Energetic brushwork. And it's always been a problem for me in teaching that a lot of my students think I paint in a dynamic way, in a wild way. They make the same mistake about people like Van Gogh and Monet. They work in a very slow, determined method. Every color carefully mixed and then carefully placed. That color there is too dark, too light. So I'll make it darker with a bit of green into it. There. That one there. That was too pale. So I want to get some green in there, deeper green, and I'll take it out of the lemon into the surrounding area on purpose. Because I'm looking for transitions, I'm looking for softening of edges later. At the moment, the edges are not really softened. They are just going outside the outlines. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. So I'll do one more. Just here where I also want this, this little kind of, it looks like a scar on the lemon. Isn't really one, but I'll just do that one. So, the lemon is coming to life now. Then, there is a genuine highlight on the lemon, just there. Oh, and I'll try and place that highlight now. I try and place that highlight with just about 100% pure white. About the tiniest bit of yellow into it, but really it's just pure white. Uh, it would be called, if it was a house paint, it would be called a cream or something like that. Okay, got to let the sun hit that spot and see the spot and then just place it in. One, two, three, oopsie. Three movements there. There's the highlight beginning to appear, but it's 
too strong. I want it a little bit softer, so another stroke there. there. This has to be softened with a brush now. Because it's very, 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 very hard. There. Okay, so the lemon is now coming, coming together. And what I can do to my lemon colors in certain parts of it, I can add the tiniest bit of red to it, which will make it a touch of orange. Give it a touch of orange, a little bit more red. And that will give a lovely variety of colors in the skin of the lemon. A lovely variety, maybe here. With the warmth of the orange. And I'll do that same orangey warmth just here. Drag it quite far into the surrounding area. There. That's going all right. We'll stop here and then I'll come back to it a bit later. What I've demonstrated here is using the palette knife in a dramatic way to give uh, some build up the paint. Now you notice that this whole painting is absolutely smooth, except for that tiny little area where the palette knife impasto is in place and also where some of the uh, impasto has been done with the brush. Now what I want to do is to show that the palette knife is not essentially a uh, a dramatic, uh, wild, expressionistic tool. The palette knife can also show the most beautiful, delicate strokes. So I'll start one in there and drag it across like that. But now in this case, I'm dragging it to be to be thin and to break up a little bit. And so it's a beautiful stroke, but it's not it's not loud. It's not brash. It's very sensitive. And now I'm looking for the biggest spot that I can try the same thing again, probably there, there. So I'm scrubbing it a bit. Sometimes it's necessary right, to, make it, to make that stroke smooth. So, all blending in nicely, so I can just get some more light into this color, the same color, just more luminosity. Because I think I'm darkening it a little bit, or the overall tonality is darkening itself as I work like this. Okay, this one should work nicely. And I'm going to apply this one here. Down. Stroke. Stop. And lift. So I can make it a bit dramatic by lifting off nicely like that. Gives a bit of energy, but if I don't want that energy there, I just blend it together and soften it and blend it. That's rather nice. I like the blending in this quiet area better. I like the energy there, but I can make a more energetic stroke here in this area and with this color. And I'll make one of them, and that one I'll make there. Doesn't really matter where, but I'll make this dramatic there. Dramatic. Drag, stop, and dramatic. So that one's dramatic. Now, this is the building process, the building steps of the painting. I'll make one more with a palette knife. And I'll do it there near the edge of this lemon here. I'll make it relatively dramatic. Broader. Broader. And there we go. Let it lift nicely. Let it sit up nicely there. So that's enough with a palette knife. But what I've done is I've neglected the other side of the lemon. I have neglected uh, above the lemon. The colors above the lemon. So I'll pick up one stroke there and place it there and drag it into the shadow area. This palette knife is giving me problems. It looks as if the blade might have been damaged and bent. 
because it's not taking it in the middle of the knife. Okay, yeah. So I have to work it a bit to get what I want. There. Right, last stroke. This one now has been mixed with a palette knife, but I apply it with a brush that I used in the beginning. More blue. And I'll apply it here down, drag, stop and lift, turn over, down, drag, stop and lift. I don't like it when there's a, a lump of paint in the middle of my paint strip. So, coming on nicely. I want to stop at this point because at this point it is clear that we are building the painting. We're not finishing the painting. As we carry on with this exact same method, the transition from building the painting to finishing the painting will slowly start. And finishing the painting is bringing in focus, bringing in atmosphere, bringing in uh, harmony, and bringing in uh, dramatics, uh, a little bit of outline here and there, and things like that. Okay, that will be the, in the next in the next video. This is how we build the painting. There's one more thing that I would like to try and demonstrate if I can find the right brush. And now I can draw a line the outline of that lemon where it should be right through all this impasto that I've done here like that that line's a little bit hard and a little bit dark so I'll draw another line there which should be a little bit paler and blend into that one that's too pale What this rigor brush does is it brings back definition. At the moment I think there's a little bit too much definition. So what I would do here, I'd have to mix that scumble color again. And then with that color, scumble color mixed on, I'll drag it over that line. But now it's not, I, it's, I'm not really sure. So I'm going to take some of that with my finger and drag it through a little bit. Just drag it through to dissolve that hardish line and make it a little bit softer. That then is another accidental effect. When you accidental effects, okay, they're good. I'm looking for them all the time. You don't, if you make an accident on purpose, then I suppose te technically you'd have to say it's no longer an accident. But accidents generally work beautifully okay building building phase is done uh, now we'll have to start working on refining and refining and articulating edges edges edge 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 fields and transitions transitions going over things that will be for the final stage, the third stage of this painting.